Final Decade Before the End Jewish and Christian History by Ed Stevens Narrated by David Clark Introduction Ever since the booklet, What Happened in AD 70 was published in 1980, there have been constant requests for more detailed information about the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jewish, Roman and Christian history associated with it. Over the years since then, I have studied Josephus, Josipon, Hegesippus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Eusebius, the Talmud, Madrash, Zoar, Pseudepigrapha, Church Fathers, Apocrypha, Dead Sea Scrolls and other Jewish Christian writings, trying to determine exactly what happened, when it happened and the effect it had upon the Church. Then, in 2002, after I began to promote J.S. Russell's view of the literal rapture, the demand for historic documentation of the fulfilment of all eschatological events dramatically increased. That forced me to dig much deeper. So, in 2007, I put together a 24-page chronology of first century events. Two years later, in 2009, we published a more substantial 73-page manuscript entitled First Century Events in Chronological Order. That helped fill the void, but it did not go far enough. It only increased the appetite for a more detailed and documented history, historical reconstruction of first century events. In 2010, I began expanding that 73-page manuscript and presenting it on my weekly podcast. Four years later, it had become almost 500 manuscript pages, including the intertestamental history of all the events from the birth of Christ up to the end of the first century. That was way too much material for a single volume. So we chopped it up into smaller sections. However, the amount of material covering the last dozen years before the Jewish war was still 250 manuscript pages, about half of the total. That was a large amount of material to include, but it is necessary in order to form a comprehensive understanding of what was really happening to Christianity during the final decade just before the end. One of the major purposes I had when I began this historical study was to discover when each of the New Testament books was written along with a good understanding of the historical circumstances which prompted and facilitated their production and distribution. Even though that was a worthy goal, I never imagined what else I would discover on the journey. While interacting all the internal and external evidences of the date and authorship of these writings, the plethora of other insights about the history of the apostles and the saints uncovered. Soteriological, eschatological and ecclesiastical issues popped up everywhere, begging for examination. One historical fact led to another, brick upon brick, until a coherent history of the first century church began to emerge. The project quickly mushroomed into a full-blown historical reconstruction of first century Christianity with its development of the New Testament scriptures and its experience of all the end-time fulfilments that Jesus and the Apostles had promised them. In order to gain a deep understanding of the first century, we need to experience it like an eyewitness. We need to know not only what happened and when, but where it happened and why, and how it is related to the overall plan of redemption. That requires us to go far beyond the mere recital of dates and events that are contained in this book. To look at maps, atlases, archaeological artefacts, timelines and photos. After doing that kind of intense study, I now almost feel like I was there and experienced those things firsthand. I've also heard so many dear brothers say that a visit to the biblical lands is tremendously helpful. The more we immerse ourselves in the first century historical context, the better we will understand eschatology and our Christian faith. We need to know how all these events interrelate with each other and connect to the biblical plan of redemption. 
There is a lot more to discover here than just the documentation of the fulfilment of all eschatological events. There is a profound providential plan running through all these events that will bless your socks off when you catch sight of it and follow it through to its consummation. My goal was not to produce a mere catalogue of all the unsupported speculations about what might have happened, such as Eusebius appears to have done in some cases, but rather to ascertain at the mouth of two or more credible witnesses exactly what did occur, in what sequence it occurred, and how it interrelated with other Jewish, Roman and Christian events. My method was to use the very best sources as those close to the first century as possible, e.g. the New Testament and Josephus, and to use their internal evidence as the main basis of this chronology. Whenever there are known dates that have been confirmed by multiple witnesses, these are used as foundations to build the other dates upon. But this is not just an annotated list of events, pulled from Josephus' jumbled accounts and arranged into chronological order. We do engage in a significant amount of historical reconstruction, educated guesses, but hopefully no historical revisionism. The reader will have to be the judge of that. In my research of other historical documentaries, I noticed that many of them separate the Jewish, Roman and Christian events into three separate lists. That approach simply does not work for me since it does not reveal very much of the interrelationships between the events. I needed to have all the Jewish, Roman and Christian events put together in one continuous chronological list. I did not realise at first how helpful that would be by putting all three of those lists together into one continuous stream with seemingly unrelated events right next to each other. The patterns and interrelationships began to appear. Little nuances and details that never had any obvious significance before now revealed connections between events that I had not noticed previously. One detail led to another, and then another, and then another, connecting the dots. Those relationships between events were an additional dynamic that I had not anticipated. They provided far more insight than a mere chronological list of events could do. It's like the old saying, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. As I began to perceive some of those relationships between events, my interest was riveted. I was now finally able to put together not just a list of independent events, but a coherent interpretation of those events and their impact upon each other. This is what historical reconstruction is all about. The Book of Acts does not give a lot of detail about other Roman and Jewish events that were happening while Paul was on his various missionary journeys. For these events we have to go to the other contemporary Jewish and Roman historians such as Josephus and Tacitus. The closer we get to 70 AD, the more important all of these Jewish and Roman events became. They form an important backdrop behind the Christian events and show how all the predictions made by Jesus were totally fulfilled. Every high priest and zealot leader that we encounter from AD 52 onwards are directly connected with the events of the last days. These are heating up, not only for the Christians, but also for the Jews and Romans. Paul, on his missionary journeys, was clearly following a plan, which was providentially arranged for him by Christ. 1. To plant new churches among all nations, and not Jews. 2. Appoint elders and deacons in every city. Acts 14, 23, 1 Corinthians 4, 17. 3. Write inspired epistles to guide them. 4. Instruct his fellow workers to teach those things to faithful men who would be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2 2. And 5. Establish the Gentiles in the church and make them one united body with the Jews. Ephesians 4. Everywhere Paul went, he followed this pattern. We see this clearly as we study the historical narrative in Acts and Paul's other epistles that were written during this time. These are essential patterns that the Apostles evidently 
bound upon both Gentile and Jewish Christians, and which were intended to be the pattern for all future generations of the eternal church. Ephesians 3, 21, 2 Timothy 2, 2. We begin our study by looking at the most likely dates for Matthew, AD 31 to 38, and Mark, AD 38 to 44, and then proceed to the first three epistles of Paul, Galatians 1 and 2 Thessalonians, which were written on his second missionary journey, AD 51 to 53. Including these five books in our study allows us to date all 27 books of the New Testament and show how the New Testament canon was formed and completed before the outbreak of the Jewish war in AD 66. The study of New Testament canonization in itself is a good reason for reading this work, without even looking at the historical fulfilment of all the end time prophecies that we are documenting here. After looking at the dates of these first five books, we then move on into the third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, which began in AD 54. It was during this final dozen years from AD 54 until AD 66 that the birth pangs and signs of the end started increasing in both intensity and frequency, along with a quickening pace of the New Testament books being written. We show how 19 of our 27 New Testament books, 70%, were written during these last five years, just before the neuronic persecution, AD 60 to 64. The Great Commission was finished and the rest of the end time events predicted in the Olivet Discourse were fulfilled during that time of tribulation upon the church and the days of vengeance upon the unbelieving Jews, Luke 21, 22. This has been a challenging journey, but often very exciting and inspiring. And yet there is so much more buried underneath the service that needs the attention of future preterist students and scholars. I hope they will use this as a launching pad to take it much further. We have no doubt missed the mark in some of our explanations here, but it still provides something with which to start with and which to compare and contrast future studies. That alone provides justification for this work. Admittedly, some of these events and dates are based on very slim evidence and are nothing more than deduction based upon the best internal evidence that I could ferret out from the primary sources. But hopefully, there are no suggestions here that are pure speculation without any basis in any kind of fact. We may never know for sure exactly when, where or how the Apostle Paul was martyred, but using the facts that he mentioned, people, places, sequences, future intentions, etc., we can reconstruct what could have happened, and maybe even what probably happened. That is just one example of the benefits of this kind of historical study. There will be many such insights that will materialise in our minds as you read through this chronology. We are devoted to chasing after the biblical and historical truth, wherever it leads and whatever it takes. This book was written for truth chasers like you. There are so many confusing voices out there in the religious world who comprise the truth and lead people astray. We need certainly and absolutely to anchor our faith so we're not cast about by every wind of speculation and false doctrine that blows through. We need to go back to the Bible and see what it really says, not what others think it says. We need to be Bereans who search the scriptures daily to see whether these things have been taught are really true. After studying this history, I no longer read the New Testament in the same way I did before. May your understanding of the first century Jewish, Roman and Christian history be stimulated and stretched and richly blessed as much or more than mine has you will probably perceive a lot of additional insights into first century history that we did not notice here. When you do, please email me and let me know about it. And if you notice any parts of this which are clearly defective and incorrect, please do me the favour of letting me know about it so then I can correct it before the next edition.